Attendance is on, guys, so please put it. Thank 
Okay, so we have crossed 50. Good. So let us start. Um, any uh, any questions from the last time? So uh, the idea is that you guys <coughs> are now supposed to make class diagrams for your project. Some of you have uh, already started. Some of you are still in the process of finding a good project. That is something that you'll have to to, to take care because we don't have enough time left now. <clears throat> so whatever projects you guys are planning to do, please finalize it within the next couple of days. Okay. Um, and I think I have made it uh, quite clear that what exactly is it that I'm expecting from you in the project. So um, if your projects are not uh, going to achieve those aspects, um, it is probably still better to change it rather than doing a project just for the namesake so so please uh, you know get along and, and try to do some work okay <clears throat> mm. so uh, we have four weeks left now including this one uh, and uh, all uh, you know all the remaining weeks that we are going to have we are basically going to cover some aspects of uml so for instance uh, in the previous lecture we covered the class diagram and then other than that i'll just give you certain hints or I, it's it's uh, really difficult to give you a lot of details but at least i'll give you certain hints on some of the important system building skills Okay. Uh, the reason uh, I'm teaching these things to you is that uh, whenever you plan to build a rather large project, uh, you'll realize this soon that the major hurdle for you will not be data structures. Okay. Unless you're doing something that is really novel, um, which happens only once in a blue moon, um, you'll, you'll basically be writing code that is not really that difficult from the perspective of data structures. Okay, so you will know where to use arrays, you'll know where to use stack, you'll know where to use uh, a queue, so on and so forth. It shouldn't be a problem for you. That is the idea. But what will be difficult for you will be to write code for achieving certain um, certain types of uh, functionality, right? So for example, you may be required to communicate over a network or you may be required to uh, have an application which is multi-threaded. I'll tell you what are multi-threaded applications today. But uh, but but this is this is these are some of the common things that you will require when you start working on projects. You know, I'm not talking about your placement preparations. For that, I think your uh, data structures itself is the most important subject. But uh, when you start working on projects. Uh, you'll you'll require certain kind of coding skills okay and these coding skills are uh, system building skills so in these four weeks we are going to look at four different um, uh, types of system building skills there are many others but uh, i thought at least i'll give you a hint of of some of them <clears throat> okay so let's start in this week we are going to have a look at multi threading examples so uh, some of the lecture some of the content of this lecture has been taken from a, a, a digression lecture in ITP. So I know that many of you did not actually watch the digression lectures because simply because they were not a part of the of the syllabus. They, uh, I was not planning to ask any questions from them in the exam. But uh, but this is something that that we are now going to cover. So if you still want, if you you can go back and uh, uh, watch the lecture D two from ITP. That is the second digression lecture. Um, so some of the content uh, has been picked up from there. Other than that, in the in the lecture 0 0.2 of ITP as well, in during week zero, when we when we met, right, uh, we we did actually look at some of the things that uh, that we are uh, 
going to look into this like into this lecture so week 0 itp and uh, lecture d2 you know digression 2 from itp um, it's not a bad idea to have a have a look at it again because uh, then maybe it's it's probably in a in a progression so you can easily understand whatever is going on in this lecture if you if you remember everything then then it's very good if you don't then uh, this is just a suggestion to um to go back and and check all that things <clears throat> so the first thing that you need to know in order to to talk about threads is process okay so so threads are basically something that we will come to talk about but before that we need to know what are processes so um you guys have been writing code now for some time right i mean um what at least 6 months or so uh, everyone in the class right even those who haven't done any programming before still you would have been writing code for about 6 months now and uh, what exactly happens when when you write code you basically type something in a code file and then you compile it and then you execute it and then you see some output on the screen so uh, what really happens is that uh, there are certain tools out there compiler and linker and so on and so forth what they do is whatever you write in uh, in a program they convert it into a form which can then be executed by your machine and you know that the execution part is different right so whenever you execute the program what happens is a new process is created okay and uh, uh, whatever happens whatever execution happens over any machine uh it happens as part of a process that is that is the first th thing you will have to understand that that there is an operating system out there and this operating system has this this mechanism of creating processes and processes are basically the uh, units of computation you can do uh, computation as part of running a process and uh, if you are on a unix based operating system this includes uh, linux or or mac os as well uh then you'll have this command called top okay if you you can try it out on your own machine as well so you can give this command top and you'll see some output out over here right so this shows you the currently running processes on your system okay so this is this is the snapshot of your system currently okay this is the point that you have to understand it is not something that is going to show you historic data this is just the data at that particular point of time so what you can see is at this particular point of time there are so many processes that are running on my machine right and uh, this this whole uh, uh, scenario where there are so many processes running simultaneously is a very common scenario okay on any typical modern day system modern day uh, operating system there will be hundreds maybe even thousands of processes um, running at any point of time and this is when you are explicitly not running too many applications right so so maybe um, your desktop is is absolutely clear right you there, there are no applications currently running but even after that there are hundreds maybe thousands of processes that are going on that are running in the background <coughs> and uh, by the way if you want to see uh, some of the attributes of these processes um, top can also show that so for example this column shows you the amount of cpu percentage this is a kind of an average uh, over the previous few uh, few seconds maybe so so it shows you the 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 percentage of cpu that was hogged or uh, that is being hogged by this particular process similarly the proportion of main memory that has been dedicated for executing this process so there are certain certain types of information that uh, top top can give you so please try it out you know have a look at it so um, coming back to what processes are it could be it, uh, you know an informal way to say uh, what a process is is uh, that they are basically units of execution that your operating system execute so if you want any piece of code to be executed uh sorry i was not checking the chats is the voice voice fine now can everyone hear me yes sir 
Okay, okay, so sorry. I mean, I, I, uh, there is some issue, but no. At my end, the internet seems to be. I mean, there is issue with my my broadband, but at as of now, I don't think it it is there. It's 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 fine. Um, okay, so anyhow, uh, by the way, when I when I'm in the full screen mode, if uh, if possible, try to, you know, unmute yourself and and uh, and uh, you know stop me. Because uh, once in a while I do check the chats, but uh, uh, usually when I'm speaking in full screen, it, it it's not possible to check chats that often. Anyhow, so uh, uh, yeah, so so we were talking about processes. So basically, processes are in some ways the units of execution at your in your system. So your system, that is your operating system. If you want any piece of computation done by this by this uh, this operating system fellow. Then uh, you have to talk to the talk to your OS and tell, okay, this is what I want to be executed. And then what the operating system really does is that it creates a new process for you, and uh, whatever computation is to be done, it happens as the part of running the process. So uh, the operating system basically has a fixed template. Okay, it's not really something that is ad hoc. It's it's a fixed template. So there is a fixed way to create. Uh, 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 create processes, you know, execute them, um, terminate them. So, so there is a fixed process. There is a sorry. There is a fixed uh, a template for uh, for for doing all this for a new process. This whole template is known as the process life cycle. Okay. So the overall idea is something like this. At any point of time, uh, a process can be can set can be said to have a particular state. Okay, it could be in one of the pos one of the three possible states. So these three possible states are ready, running, and blocked. Okay. So what is ready? So let us say you created uh, a process. You created a process as in you executed. Uh, for example, you executed a uh, a program that uh, that you wrote. So now uh, it doesn't mean that as soon as you ask the operating system to run the program. The program is executed. That that doesn't happen. I mean, in most cases, it will not happen. In uh, uh, you know, just like this. So what really happens is the operating system has a queue. So now you understand what a queue is, right? It's a, a queue is a FIFO data structure. First in, first out. So whomsoever goes in first comes out first. That is the idea. So so the operating system has a queue. Okay, and in this queue. Um, Whenever you you uh, uh, place a new request to create a new process, this request uh, means something has to be done. You know, some uh, some bookkeeping work has to be done. So some space in the main memory is required because if you go back to our uh, uh, lecture 0.2 from ITP in week zero, um, I showed you how a typical assembly language program is executed. Right, so. Uh, you, the the code has to be within the main memory, and then the program counter simply walks through that code one line at a time, and then it is executed by the CPU. So uh, the first thing you have to do for the code to be executed is to find some place within the main memory where the the code related to the process can be loaded. So that is that is some tasks that must be done first. Similarly, there might be some other bookkeeping work that is required. So, so the so as soon as you ask the operating system to uh, run some piece of code and basically execute your program or whatever it is, the first thing that the operating system has to do is manage these things. It has to come up with some some place where your program will be put in the main memory. But once all of this is done, right? Once uh, uh, this this bookkeeping keep, task is ready. Um, you, the next step that is required is to simply execute the code. At that point of time, this process, this newly created process, gets added to a queue. Okay, this is known as the, uh, this is often known as the ready queue. So what happens is in, in the ready queue is these are processes which are ready to be executed but are currently not executing. Okay, so so in some ways they are waiting for their turn in a line. Right? Why? Why I have? Why they? Do, why do they have to wait in a line? Because uh, the actual execution of the code takes place in within uh, inside the CPU. If you go back to our uh, uh, our 0.2 lecture, 
so you would have re read that there is an alu and there is a cu okay so and this and plus some registers these three are basically the major components of a cpu the central processing unit so the execution can only happen inside the cpu everything else is just a uh, you know uh, it's like logistics to to get the things done so so what happens is uh, these these processes which are supposed to be executed they wait for their turn in a queue and the operating system has some mechanism some mechanism by which it decides when will a particular process get a chance to execute its code over the cpu okay and as soon as a process is selected for this task we call that the process is running okay running as in this process is now being executed by the cpu now once the process starts executing it could happen that uh, it it basically terminates naturally terminates naturally as in uh, it's it was a small process it uh, it did not require too much of a time the the number of instructions were not not too many so so maybe within a few uh, let us i i will i i won't say seconds because seconds is a huge unit in terms of cpu but uh, people usually say cycles okay so within a few cycles the 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 process has executed so then it will get terminated otherwise let us say the process is a is is somewhat long and and it is it is continuing to run what will happen is that um, other processes which are waiting for the cpu they'll they'll have to wait for a long time so what really happens is that um, there is a there is a, a particular uh, uh, there are certain particular events that often occur with many processes which provides this the operating system a chance to put this particular process the running process into some kind of a you know different state so that someone else can actually access the cpu and this state this some the other state is known as the blocked state so a typical example of when a process might run into a blocked state is input output for example uh, you guys have used scanf and cin right what is the what is the job of scanf and cin you take input from the user right so let us say you want an integer or a string or something like that from the user you use something like cin or 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 scanf right so at that point of time what really happens your program actually halts halts as in it's it starts waiting you have to type the input and let us say press enter and only after that will your program execute right do you know this that that uh, that essentially your program gets paused at that point of time waiting for the input right so such a scenario where a particular process cannot continue to execute unless some input or output has been performed such in such a case in such a scenario the uh, the process is said to have entered in the blocked state there are other reasons for blocking as well for but uh, this is the most common reason and for you it's much it's very easy to understand it as well so so what happens is that uh, uh, if the process gets blocked it it is because of some event event being for example that the user is still typing something and uh, when the user presses enter then essentially the input output has completed so now now the process is again ready to be executing again um but as i said right maybe in this during this time when when you were waiting someone else got the chance to to use the cpu so now you go back to the ready state the process will go back to the ready state and it will wait for its turn to to i'll i'll show you a different picture later onwards just to show you what exactly does it look like but before that this is just a, now this is these things you should already know but i have uh, i've just put it again so this is an over simplified view of how a process looks like we have seen this in the in week 0 of itp as well so basically this is this this whole block is currently in the main memory and uh, uh, there, there there is some code written here within the main memory and there is some memory which has been um which has been uh, set aside for storing variables so there is there is some code memory and uh, this code by the way is not c c++ java code okay this is 
this is the code that we have seen as i said in week 0 of itp so this is this is these are binary codes okay 0 1 1 0 kind of thing so if you remember uh, there is a there is an operation code here there is the, there's an there is the address of the operand so on and so forth so that kind of code is lying here and uh, there is some other part of the memory which is to, which is used to store data right so this data essentially are the variables in your program the local variables stack heap everything okay so this is at a different place within this this process and uh, there are different types of memory you already know that there is there is stack and there is there is there's heap and then there is something known as a program counter right so what happens is that a program counter executes the program so basically it's not it doesn't execute the program it, it it essentially points to the next instruction that is supposed to be executed by the cpu so we have discussed program, um, program counter as well so now what exactly is the idea of multitasking so assume that i I've just, i showed you that top command right top command and uh, it showed that at one point of time there are so many processes which are running right but the problem is if you your your, your machine will only have one cpu well at least one uh, if these days you might have two or four or eight also eight cores are also not so uncommon these days uh, in uh, um, in in laptops but but when there is still a limit right there are there are only eight cores it means that at any point of time at any point of time there are only eight cpus that are available so you should not be able to run more than eight processes because that is the maximum you can do but this is where multitasking comes into picture okay it's uh, this is how most of the operating systems work today what they really do is they keep a set of processes alive simultaneously so when i say alive it means that these processes were created and they have not yet died okay so they are still alive and uh, uh, it also means that uh, the there are multiple processes within the main memory not just one process and uh, uh, many a times not all the alive processes might be in main memory but there are, but a good proportion of the alive processes will also be there within the main memory when i say within the main memory means they have this kind of a block in main memory so what happens is the operating system just picks one of them assuming that we are working on a on a single cpu machine so the operating system just picks one of them it executes it for some time and then puts it back in the ready state again okay this is this is when the 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 process doesn't get terminated on its own because of you know the 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 computation that was required has completed as well as the process is not running into any blocked state because of input output if both these things do not happen that is the the process continues to execute then what operating system does is that after some amount of time has elapsed it basically stops this process okay it, it takes away the cpu from this process and then gives it to someone else okay so this this amount of time for which a particular process can execute while it is not blocking while uh, it is not terminating this is known as a time quantum okay so what uh, the operating system really does is that it keeps a number of processes alive simultaneously and then in a judicious fashion it starts allotting time quantums to all of these processes and usually it happens in a round robin fashion round robin as in all the processes will get the uh, uh, the the cpu for some justified amount of time okay in, it's it's not exactly round robin there might be some priorities that kick in but for now just assume that there, it is a round robin case that let us say there are five different processes so if the first one gets 50 milliseconds then the, the then the second one will also get 50 milliseconds then the third one will get 50 so on and so forth and then it will come back to the first process something like this so with in this way what really happens is that uh, you can keep multiple processes alive all of them can do can perform some amount of computation 
okay and this switch switch from one process to another process is done at such a high pace you know it it is done so fast that to you it would seem as if multiple processes are running simultaneously but the idea is only one process if you have a single cpu machine only one process any questions okay so only one process can actually run at a time but what really is happening the the cpu is being shared by so many processes in 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 you know in in such a short amount of time that it might seem to you as if they are all they are all executing simultaneously it's it's like watching a video you know right how videos are prepared um videos are nothing more than let us say a uh, projection of images at a very high pace okay uh, there are certain number of frames per second that are shown to you right you you might be already knowing it so this is the whole concept of showing you a video a video is not really continuous that too is is actually discrete but the number of frames per second if you increase it beyond certain limit if i'm not wrong it is somewhere i think 15 20 frames or so if it is beyond that then the human mind cannot interpret it as as distinct frames the human mind will interpret it as if it's some kind of 30 yeah i i, I mean i i'm not sure what exactly is the number there is some some number okay uh, if the number is less than that you will see a lag okay you will still probably see it as a as a video but a lagging video you know where where there are some lags in the video and beyond a certain uh, frame rate you might even start feeling that this video is is accelerated i think uh, 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 with with some of these uh, uh, hd videos you might feel as if uh, um, uh, if the number of frames are higher per second you might feel as if the video is moving fast but it's not really moving fast it's it's just that your mind is not able to process so much of information in such a short amount of time anyhow so going back to the uh, to the example of of multitasking so what exactly is multitasking there are multiple processes that are that are executing simultaneously and what really happens is that the operating system makes a switch from one process to another process in a very short span of time so to you it would look like all the processes are executing simultaneously the value of the program counter is very crucial here why because if i am actually taking back the cpu from a running process the next time when this same process gets the time quantum where should it start executing okay should should it start from the beginning no then then it doesn't make any sense right because then certain processes will never make any progress um so so what you have to make sure is that the processes start their execution from the exact same point where they left it right so in such a case you have to keep the value of the program counter safe somewhere that uh, when when i took the cpu away from this process the program counter was at this particular location so when i give this process the cpu again the program will start executing from that position itself so as long as you are able to save program counter and there is some more information that you have to store thus for example the the values of different uh, registers and and different locations of the memory so on and so forth so as long as you are able to to restore that to the same state uh, uh, you know the state at which the cpu was taken away from the process as long as you can do that you can easily restore the computation of a process so this is just a pictorial view of what really happens so let us say you have three um, three processes in your system so these two are currently waiting in the ready state and process 1 gets the chance to execute now here the the time quantum expires so at that point of time the cpu is taken away from process 1 it is given to process 2 now process 1 and 3 are in the ready state and process 3 is ahead of process 1 why because in a queue it is fifo first in first out so so process 3 is ahead of process 1 so when the next quantum expires uh, process 3 gets the chance to execute 
so process 3 is executing now at this point of time the process gets blocked because of let us say some input output so then uh, the the cpu is taken away from the process and then it could be given to the next process within the within the queue so this is this is not really uh, an accurate description okay this is just to tell you how the things really work how multitasking actually works okay this is this is please don't think that it will it will go back to process one whether this quantum will be half who who will get the next quantum all these are details okay that you for that you don't need to worry about as of now you'll study all this in operating system but this is the overall idea this is how the overall multitasking gets implemented by operating system any questions till here so now you understand what it means when when you, when i say multitasking now you understand how uh, your machine which may not have more than one two four uh, better to build a separate hardware for uh, i i don't understand your question properly build a separate hardware for multiplication why would you build a separate hardware i don't understand like to program for it sir, sir in alu we have a adder yes yes so, so in adder we we, we mm -hmm. have to build oh okay 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 i got your question so see um have you guys done a course in digit on, on in um, in uh, digital design or something like that so uh, do you guys have any course on that so you guys have done everything like adders and subtractors and all those things are covered is it you you uh, you guys know everything about adders subtractors multiplexers decoders encoders is is that is that uh, has has these things been covered in your syllabus already okay so so then yeah so then um, then maybe the answer will not be uh, many people will not be able to understand it but uh, uh, to answer your question, yes, um, it's the reason that most of the things, uh, most of the times we actually make hardware, which is, which is pretty generic in nature. And then we try to achieve stuff in software. The reason for it is that producing hardware is a costly affair. Okay. Um, if you want to produce a new chip, for example, um, you can talk to the people who work in the hardware uh, part. It's a very, it's a challenging job, you know, ch designing chips uh, with all those, uh, those elements. It's a challenging thing to do. Okay. You have to do so many different levels of testing and, and uh, there are so many different levels of quality control through which it must pass before you can introduce any change at the chip level or, or introduce any new, um, you know, you know, change in the hardware. So it's very difficult to change hardware. Compared to that, it is relatively cheaper as well as easier to add new software elements. Okay, do you do you get the point? This is why normally we do not try to uh, add stuff. It doesn't mean that we never do. Okay, sometimes it might make more sense. So, uh, have you guys heard about something known as TPU, Transaction Processing Units? Uh, some of you may have heard about it. So all those people who work with the uh, with blockchains or uh, uh, you know the, the so there is a there is a new whole uh, a whole new world of these uh, uh, cryptocurrencies and all. Okay, so there is something known as TPU. I'm not sure how many of you um, would have heard about it. It's called a transaction processing unit. So uh, but but they are they are specific kinds of um, uh, uh, hardware which are which are better for certain types of tasks okay for example machine learning so the tpus are supposed to be for machine learning if i am not wrong there are some hardware chips which are good at cryptocurrency related stuff uh, i i I'm, i don't have too much interest in cryptocurrency and blockchain but if i am not wrong some hardware has been produced which can which can calculate uh, uh, certain types of which, which can perform certain types of computations faster so because these kinds of computations are required for the blockchain guys 
so so yeah it does happen sometimes we do produce uh, specialized hardware for a particular problem but it's it's really very rare more often than not uh, the hardware we use is community hardware and then over that we do all types of software stuff okay uh, any more queries so now you guys understand that what exactly happens because of which um, your machine which might only have one two or four cpus that machine still is able to execute hundreds maybe thousands of processes this is the way this is the way it is done okay they share the cpu uh, for certain amount of time so whatever we studied till now right we said that there are processes and uh, the operating system has uh, has to maintain a, 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 a you know a tem uh, it has to maintain certain number of processes at one point of time and for each process it maintains some information at the least it has to store the program counter so that it knows that from where should i start executing the next time this process is is given the cpu so this much is clear now so now uh, threads are essentially light weight processes okay or alternatively you can say that uh, processes are kind of heavy weight threads we, it's it's about how you see how you see these two so now imagine that uh, there is a process which requires multiple program counters why it will require multiple program counters that i'll i'll tell you in a in a minute but assume that there is a process which has multiple program counters okay so when such a process gets the cpu it can then choose so this this is an internal decision of the process okay uh, the it will what the what the operating system will do is it will it will give the process a chance to execute but within the process it now has the liberty to choose any one of these these multiple program counters and say that okay from here onwards i'll start executing in this particular counter okay uh, so in such a case we basically say that this particular process has multiple threads of execution okay so the so a thread is something like this um, you see how these um, these ropes are made right they are basically made up by uh, intertwining a number of smaller threads right this is how you create a, a strong rope uh, a rope is is seldom a single uh, uh, you know uh, it's made up of it's it's seldom made up of a single fiber basically so many fibers are intertwined with each other and then it constitutes a rope right so similarly this is the way to look at it that a process is like a rope and these and there are threads within it right some smaller finer threads within it okay so when i say that there is a process which has multiple program counters what i really want to say is there are multiple threads of execution within the process out of which uh, the process can pick any one based on some policy okay at whenever the process gets the quantum it can pick any one of these threads and then execute it okay so so now now there are two levels of of uh, of scheduling here right so one is the scheduling that the operating system is doing it has multiple processes that are active it picks one of them based on some strategy for example round robin strategy and then gives it the the cpu to execute for some amount of time then there is a second level of scheduling so within the process the process has multiple threads of execution for now just assume that these multiple threads of execution are essentially multiple mains okay for now let us say that you have multiple mains in your system they are not really mains but i'm just trying to tell you that uh, to to assume that assume that you are you have a program that has three different mains for example not just one main but three different mains and then you can decide which of the three mains do i want to execute in okay and uh, so this decision is with the process the process can decide which of the multiple threads of execution that it has can execute next okay so this uh, i mean i the the that 
um, the distinction between process and threads is not really as crisp as I told you. Okay, when when you'll study operating systems, you will come to know that it's it's a very hodgepodge kind of situation. In certain cases, the the operating system can can deal with threads as well. In certain situations, um, you know. Uh, there are so many things that can happen by the way so so but but for now for just a beginner assume that this is this is how the things work that operating system deals with processes and within a process i can have multiple threads of executions okay so now a typical process looks something like this you have some code here some code here some code here and all these th three pieces of code, they are basically independent of each other. They are not related to each other. And then you have three program counters, PC1, PC2, and PC3. And then you also have three different sets of memory for variables and stuff, okay? And these are independent, okay? And now, uh, so this is like mini programs within a huge program, okay? And whenever this particular process gets a chance to execute, it can decide which piece of code I will execute next. Okay, so it is possible that first program counter is here, second program counter is here, third one is here. Okay, and then it decides, okay, let me give some time for this program counter. It executes for a while. And then there can be even an internal switching, internal switching between one thread to another thread. So then uh, suddenly the process says, okay, you've executed enough. Let me give it to the second thread. Okay, so then the second thread executes for a while and then it goes to the third thread. All this has to happen within the time quantum that was allotted for this particular process. So basically it's a different level. Uh, the operating system will give the time quantum to the process and within the process it can actually have multiple threads of execution and it can decide when when should uh, uh, you know time be given to which thread. And there is some all, some common memory also. So with the help of this common memory, these threads can talk to each other. So now can uh, uh, we? This is what we will cover here in the next uh, uh, in the next lecture. I'll show you how you can create a multi-threaded program in C or C plus um, plus. By default, whatever you whatever you write, that is a single threaded program. If you just have this one main function, it's 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 a single threaded program. So a single threaded program is essentially you know a program without any threading. Okay. But uh, um, uh, you can write a multi-threaded program in C and C plus plus, and I will show you some examples tomorrow. Okay, but but uh, any questions? Any can anyone actually think about? Uh, you know what so what could be an example where any process would like such such a kind of a scenario where it would like to run three mini programs simultaneously any any example that you can think of where a process would like let us say three different threads of execution simultaneously what could be a typical example of something like this you are we are we are using an example right now by the way <laughs> okay webex currently what are the things that we are doing with webex so i'm sharing my screen that is one task that webex is doing for us so whatever whenever i uh, whenever i move my mouse you are able to see it right so so this is one task that webex is doing for us there is another task and that is webex is transmitting my my voice right i mean i'm i'm speaking something and you guys are able to hear it right this is a completely different task you understand uh, transmitting the the screen and the screen events uh, versus transmitting the voice this is this is a completely different aspect okay and similarly there are some some buttons on this uh, on my on my layout right i can i can type chats uh, yeah right so 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 there are so many tasks and and it is the same webex webex process right and uh, it is able to do all of these things why because there are multiple threads of execution okay and each thread is doing some task in a dedicated fashion so there is probably a thread which is responsible for 
sending my video from my system and the the video being received at your your end there is another uh, thread which is probably uh, looking into the chats part you know has any has anyone added something typed something in chat okay and if if you press enter then this thread make sure that it gets uh, sent to all the participants there might be another thread which is which is uh, capturing my voice and then transmitting it so you understand why would a process require something like this why do i need three mains for example because the first main mains job is to capture my video and send it the second mains job is to capture my voice and send it the third mains job is to is to look at chats okay there could be fourth and fifth and so many other means so is this part clear now why would a process require multiple threads because maybe it's a complex process there are multiple things that it might need to do simultaneously so that that is why yeah so that is why it needs different threads of execution okay so that is why you you need different uh, program counters at at any point of time so if this if you guys have any queries on this please ask me now because after that i just have one more slide so this is kind of the last slide is the thread part clear what exactly is the thread why do you need multi threaded programs if if this part is clear then then i'll show you how to build simple multi threaded application uh, a simple multi threaded program i will call it uh, in c and c++ in the next lecture but at least is it clear now what 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 is the need for multi threading how does multitasking work on your on your system if there are any queries you can ask okay then so in that case this is the last slide so basically there is something known as posix portable operating system interface and uh, it is essentially a set of standards and uh, these standards provide you application programming interfaces or apis as we call them often okay uh, so these these standards provide you apis for doing many system related stuff right system management stuff uh, for example you can manage processes you can create processes um, you know uh, kill them so on and so forth uh, you can perform networking you can create threads so there are there are apis provided by posix for doing all these things um so uh, although they were supposed to be portable across uh, operating system so essentially you write code at one place and it will work at the others it's it's it it usually works only within the unix and linux systems the i, I don't think uh, uh, it works on i have never tried maybe it 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 could be there in windows also these days but uh, windows did not really have any support if i remember for posix uh, uh, they were very they they have their own set of ways to to do all these things they don't use posix um, but yeah maybe things have things could have changed i don't know so uh, so anyhow uh, these modules for 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 doing all these things they are available through uh, through a programming interface in c and c++ uh, there is a header file called pthread.h and okay and this is minus l p thread actually so you can link it at the linking page with minus l p thread and uh, then uh, you can use it in your own programs and how to do that that i will show you in the next lecture okay we are done any queries none okay guys so uh, uh please keep working on your projects keep sending me emails if you have anything to share or discuss and uh, uh, we'll have an extra class tomorrow um time will be tentatively 5 or so you know tomorrow evening 5ish uh, i would say i'll send you guys an email okay thank you guys bye